uh, from my studio here just outside of Atlanta and from Washington, D.C. In just a moment, I'm going to introduce to you a gentleman who needs no introduction for those of you that work in healthcare, especially those of you that understand the legal side and the regulatory side. Um, a lot of times I get an opportunity to do these big grandiose introductions for guests. Uh, but again, in this case, my special guest needs no introduction at all because he is the assistant attorney general, Kenneth Polite, and he is the head of the criminal division at Maine Justice. So with that said, I'm going to pause there and I'm going to say, your honor, on, your majesty, <laughs> sir. So good to see you, man. <laughs> It is such an honor. The privilege is all mine, yes. man. I know we got a chance to, to meet many years, many uh, months ago at one of these conferences, and we started talking about making this happen, and I'm glad it's finally a reality. Thanks again for the opportunity. Well, I, I, I love that you brought that up because I want to yeah. ask you a question, and and just asking. I, I want to, I, because I know how many people you meet on a daily basis, but I want to see if you'll make me feel <laughs> special. Well. Do you, do, you, do you actually remember I, I, how If I were? remember correctly, you came up to me and you tried to introduce yourself. And I think I recognized you either by name or by <laughs> probably not as Sean, but I probably said, oh, compliance guy. And I was like, and you were like shocked that I knew. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I've, I've seen your podcast a couple times and uh, the videos. And, uh, and yeah, we went from there. I was like a giddy little schoolgirl. I, because I was literally standing next yep. to Robert Lyles, who has been one of my mentors for more than 20 years. He's a former prosecutor at Justice. Uh, he was the first appointed uh, head of the fraud task force uh, way back when. And it, it, again, just real quickly, you know, I was walking up there and, you know, Kenneth was engaged in a, uh, discussion with somebody else and he you put your hand on the person's shoulder and stepped to the side and you had that big <laughs> smile on your face and you said yeah. <laughs> i know you you're that compliance guy and i was like you got to kidding man. and robert lyles at that <laughs> and at that moment robert lyles was just like you know what i'll have to kiss the ring from here on out <laughs> so <laughs> with that said um for those of you out there, um, yes, this is such a treat for me, and I'm going to bask this in the glow for a few moments. So listen, real quick, I want to get serious about this stuff because we're talking about some really serious things that Sorry. are going on in healthcare. Um, and before we get there, you know, I, I really want folks to understand your background as a compliance officer and, and really how that drives your decision-making on pursuing cases on creating policy and really on what your future focus yeah. is going to be. Yeah. Uh, so again, thank you so much, Sean, for the opportunity. As you know, I started my career. I've, I've gone back and forth between a lot of different areas of practice as an attorney uh, in the last 22 years. I've been in private practice uh, in white collar criminal defense primarily. Uh, at three different uh, stops. I started my career as an AUSA, first in the Southern District of New York, uh, before returning back to my hometown of New Orleans, where I got a chance to serve uh, as the U.S. Attorney uh, for about four years. And then uh, in 2021, obviously got the opportunity to, to, to serve in this current capacity uh, as the AEG for, for Criminal Division. But to your point, when I left the role as, as U.S. attorney in New Orleans, I had the opportunity to consider a lot of different platforms to con continue my career. And I was fortunate to have the opportunity to, to serve as a chief compliance officer uh, for, for Intergy Corporation, uh, which is based in New Orleans. In fact, it is the only Fortune 500 company based in New Orleans. Uh, and as a result, uh, it, it plays an outsized role in, in a lot of parts of philanthropy and business development in the city. I came to know many of the, the fantastic leaders there, including uh, the general counsel there, Marcus Brown, who is a fantastic colleague uh, and leader for our legal department. And so 
getting the opportunity to serve as a chief compliance officer, inheriting a department that was uh, quite mature. Uh, I, I was following on the heels of the company's first chief compliance officer ever uh, and trying to take it into the next level, primarily focused on a lot of what we talk about now in a lot of these fraud cases and when we talk about evaluations of compliance programs, um, moving it towards that risk analysis, right? Allowing your your the, 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 the tailored risk of your platform, of your entity, entity of your enterprise to drive how your compliance resources are often uh, dispersed and allocated. That was kind of the next iteration of where we were going with that compliance program. And that is something um, that informs a lot of how we talk about these issues right now um, in terms of resource allocation about uh, about some of the challenges that I saw in that role, despite the fact that it was a very robust compliance program. I, I, I know that it is oftentimes viewed as a as a cost center in a lot of organizations. Uh, it is oftentimes uh, siloed away from access to documents and data and information and witnesses that might be relevant to underlying investigations that might be relevant to other components in an organization. And so trying to develop those relationships and ensuring that compliance has an equal seat at the table with internal audit, with legal, um, with IT, when we're making business decisions uh, was a big part of what we tried to accomplish there uh, and again it is it is very much the same message that we try to impart uh, as we evaluate compliance programs here in the criminal division now it, and and that's that's such a tremendous background to help people understand that your decisions aren't simply fueled by you know political gain or anything other than your firm understanding of regulatory compliance because you sat in that seat yeah. you you had to be that objective independent individual and you know it's it's one of the things that i talk to clients about all the all the time is you know mm. when we talk about corporate misbehavior people have to understand that corporations don't misbehave it's the people yeah. that are in charge <laughs> of these corporations and not allowing compliance to have a meaningful role and a seat at that big table help foster the con travesty. It's a grave mistake in, in my humble opinion. So let me ask you if I can. Um, You know, why is it so important to the DOJ in your decision making, you know, for going to trial or deferred prosecutorial agreements or settlement agreements? How do compliance programs, effective compliance programs yeah. play into that decision making? So I, let me let me talk a little bit about that. But before we get there, I want to just step back and just talk about how in, how compliance is critical to the underlying effort which we have, which is to deter criminality, to prevent crime in the very first place, has to be one of the primary efforts of our enforcement efforts. I've seen it firsthand how compliance and compliance professionals can actually engage and help prevent crime from occurring or help it become mitigated before it spills over into much more significant harm for corporations, for individuals, for our economy. I see that, that effort in terms of preventing crime as being absolutely critical to the way that we fight crime across the, across the entire portfolio of work that we do. You've, you've probably heard me talk about this before, Sean, whether we're talking about public corruption or we're talking about violent crime. We do a lot of efforts across this entire country and, and indeed across the globe to hold people accountable, to prosecute, investigate, and make sure people are serving significant jail time when they've gone astray. 
but without engaging in that same effort at the front end to try to prevent violent crime, to help address the root causes of corruption, to help address the, the, the root causes of violent crime, to help address the root causes of some of the corporate fraud that we see, the enforcement piece is frankly just a band-aid, right? You have to be doing more to address it up front. And that's, that's where compliance for me fundamentally plays that role and can do it more, more effectively oftentimes than we as investigators, as prosecutors. So one of the things that I had an opportunity to listen to you talk at AHLA last year in Baltimore was the pushing forward of compliance certification statements. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of general counsel come and ask me, you know, how do you structure this? You know, what would you say as a compliance officer? Why do you think we should do it? So the question that I would pose to you is, what is it from your perspective as the head of the criminal division at DOJ? What is the benefit of a compliance certification statement and, and, and why are they so critical? Yeah, so, I mean, you, you know this, Sean, but in terms of our resolutions, we have required for some time at the end of a term of a, of a resolution, say a guilty plea resolution, a deferred prosecution, even some of our non-prosecution agreements, we often have required the chief executive officer and sometimes even the chief financial officer to certify at the end of the term of that agreement that the the compliance program is reasonably designed, it's implemented to, to, to detect criminality and that it is functioning effectively uh, at the end of that term. It makes a lot of sense. In my view, you have the chief executive officer, you have the chief financial officer. The person that they are missing in that equation is the person who not only supervises the exact function in their organization that they're certifying to. It's the chief compliance officer. And the reason why that has oftentimes not included a chief compliance officer certification is frankly, because in a lot of organizations, that is not an entity that sits at the same level within an organization as the chief financial officer, certainly not at the same level as other components within the organization. And so- There are punchlines yeah, exactly sometimes. Right. That's exactly right. And so my view, was that this certification process, again, what the company has been certifying is that the compliance program is designed, implemented, and is running effectively. What it ensures before anyone signs on the dotted line about that certification that the chief compliance officer has a say, has a voice about any concerns before that is signed off on. And if there's not, if there are concerns, then that certification doesn't get made. I, it is ultimately a resource, a tool to ensure that that chief compliance officer has equal footing and has a voice, a prominent voice in the organization, uh, particularly at the time of, of, of resolving and finalizing uh, a resolution. And, and look, I hear, I hear some of the concerns. Anytime we make changes in the way that we deal, deal with things, um, there's always some concerns, uh, some fears that are, are posed. I, I've, I've got a lot of folks that are compliance uh, professionals that are, are dear friends, uh, folks are concerned, is this, am I going to end up in jail if this is not accurate? Is this something about trying to catch compliance officials? It's, it is far from that. This is not kind of a gotcha kind of a situation where we're trying to get people to sign false information. Uh, this is about ensuring that the main individual who supervises that function, our important compliance functions, at the end of the day, has a critical voice at the table. And I and I I, I, I point to the fact that if if there was a situation where I was trying to be punitive towards compliance professionals, I, what I point out as Exhibit A is that very recently we hired. Um, Matt Galvin, who previously served as the chief compliance officer for Anheuser-Busch, a renowned voice in the compliance community in terms of data analytics to help lead up and, and supervise some of our compliance uh, review unit. And, and even more prominently, Exhibit B, 
Glenn Leon, who previously served as a chief compliance officer um, at, at, at Hewlett Packard, he is now our fraud section chief. You know, these are folks who have served as prosecutors as well at times and have uh, bring a very broad perspective to the table. But most importantly, these are people who have served in a compliance function and understand the challenges and frankly, the opportunities that that compliance program uh, position can bring to the work that we do here at the department. See, I love it. And it, and it really gives a different feel. It gives a different dynamic to the criminal division yeah. when you have been in corporate that understand beyond the bureaucracy, beyond the politics, that actually have real world roll up your sleeve into trenches experience to be able to say, these are the areas that are systemically, you know, needing focus. And these are the ways that we Christians to be able to, yes. you know, bring an end to that. It, it, it brings me to a question of this. Um, and, and I know I have a lot of attorneys that listen to the show, but I also have a lot of non-attorneys. And yeah. we, you know, we use words like proffer or reverse proffer. But let me ask you this. What are your thoughts on proffers where an attorney comes in, they come in with the compliance officer of the organization, and you, assistant attorney general, are asking questions, trying to understand yeah. What transpired? What led to this issue? And the attorneys are the ones answering all of the questions while yeah. the compliance individual sits there with their hands folded and, and smiling at the table. What What are your thoughts about that? Well, my, my immediate thought in that situation, and I say this from a real world example, is uh, I've got all the information that I need to know about how this organization is actually operating. I understand from that point forward uh, whether that is a compliance function and a compliance officer that has an equal footing, a seat at the table, the voice that they need to be able to raise concerns, address concerns, mitigate risks. Um, that example is one of these proffers. And for us, you know, by the time these cases, and I've got a tremendous team that deals with these types of corporate investigations, oftentimes uh, we'll have counsel come in at the tail end of that, and they want to make a final pitch to me as the head of the criminal division about, you know, why the resolution should be uh, lessened in some regard. And they'll bring, you know, the chief executive officer might be there, and, and maybe the chairman of the board might, might be there, and, and sometimes they bring um, other lawyers, both in-house and uh, outside counsel, as well as in-house counsel, and sometimes the chief compliance officer there. In one of these situations, I literally turned to the chief compliance officer and asked a question about the program and the general counsel answered. And it was like, all right, that, that tells me everything I need to know at that point related to the autonomy of that function and lack thereof. Uh, their ability to actually um, raise their concerns within an organization in a space where I'm directly addressing you, that person literally and figuratively had no voice. Uh, and that was, uh, like I said, that answers everything I need to know. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just today I gave a lecture for an organization, the NSCHBC, mm -hmm. on compliance plans, right? The, the state of compliance, how healthy is your organization and one of the one of the slides that i brought up talked about the compliance officer and i had on there that a compliance officer for an organization with an effective compliance plan where they have a demonstrated culture of compliance is often one of the most powerful people yes. in the organization not because they they wield an iron fist and they have you know unlimited power it's because they are able to function independently objectively and to affect change for an organization where problems exist and and i preach this i've been preaching this for more than 20 years and i still have people that say to me it's compliant sean what are the odds that we're really going to get caught right now, i've had people <laughs> say caught to me and i kind of laugh and i say good luck it's a gut i mean look it's but, a, 
it's you know, a daunting I, task, I, I just, but I, I think what also attracted me to that role is the same thing that attracts me, you know, back to the department, uh, and it's attracted me in other other parts of my career, the ability to help build culture and affect change in culture is something that goes beyond the, 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 the bodies that are allocated to compliance. Of course, if you think about it in terms of how can eight people or 10 people or 20 people be responsible for policing, quote unquote, tens of thousands of employees, you can't. But you can build a culture of compliance that then empowers people to raise their hands, to raise their voices where they see things going astray to help us reduce or oftentimes eliminate uh, that wrongdoing before it gets out of hand. That is such a power, like you said, such a powerful role that compliance can play that frankly, nobody else in an organization and, can play. And, and you know, to, to put an exclamation on this part of our conversation, you know, it, it doesn't matter how big or how small your organization is, you have to maintain compliance. Yes. I don't care if you're a physician practice of one delivery health system with 5,000 providers. Compliance has to be absolute. And there's no substitute for compliance. Is that a fair way to Absolutely. end that segment? Yeah, you're, you're spot on with that. Spot on. So thinking about the fact that the end of the public health emergency He is finally coming to an end, right? May, right. <laughs> and and with that, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> That's right. But you know, there's there's obviously a lot of questions. Um, you know, on the part of so many healthcare professionals. for compliance, for documentation of services, touch on some of the big ones, including telehealth and corporate after the PHE. So if it's over enforcement efforts and some of the recent proposed changes including some of the proposed DEA. Does that sound fair? Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. All right. So it's not quite a lightning round, but <laughs> I'll, I'll throw some questions at we you. Got, it, we got, it, got short uh, got a short time, so okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's talk about the regulatory changes for telehealth services that took place during the public health emergency. So uh, those regulatory changes were in response uh, to obviously a very critical need at a time when the entire country was facing a pandemic and the emergencies that uh, that came with it. As you know, a lot of those restrictions in terms of the use of telehealth restricted their use uh, to rural areas or health professional shortage uh, areas around our country. Uh, it required things like the, the patient, a beneficiary had to travel and be uh, in a particular uh, healthcare setting as opposed to in their home um, and, and the like. And so lifting some of those restrictions, in my view, was the right thing to do. It was the appropriate thing to do. And frankly, it was the necessary thing to do in order to ensure that individuals across our country were able to get the type of medical treatment that so many needed, desperately needed in some cases uh, across our country. And so in my view, um, telehealth expanded. Uh, we had a lot of companies that frankly exploded at the time as a result of that need. Uh, I don't think telehealth is going anywhere. There are some tr tremendous benefits to the telehealth platform. Uh, but some of those regulations in our view, and we've seen it over and over again, uh, have led to it, uh, an increase in terms of healthcare fraud. Yeah, and I definitely want to get to that, the fraud aspect of it. And it's important for people to remember that, you know, Congress waived a lot of these requirements during the public health emergency, right? We had the 1135 waivers specifically is what, you know, what everybody was, was looking to. Right. Um, 
I want I want to talk a little bit about with describing controlled substances because yeah. the 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 CSA has had of um, public play, right? One, you know yeah. how that's changed the landscape, but there's something even more important. And, and, and I know some people are thinking, you know, especially those who are going through criminal cases right now, you know, facing controlled substance act cases how could something be more important act opioid crisis in this country nobody disputes that and the 2008 ryan hate act yes. uh requirement of an in-person consultation before prescribing controlled substance to substances to a patient was also lifted so my question to you is um, you know, one that I've received from so many clients, especially those in behavioral health. What exactly is the Ryan Hate Act? I, I, I can't tell you how yeah. many people they read it and they're like, I don't get it. What is it? What does it mean? So the act itself is a reference to and in honor of, of Ryan Hate, an 18 year old uh, who received uh, an overdose who overdosed on Vicodin, uh, having received uh, a prescription through a telemedicine consult uh, from a physician uh, who he had, he had never met, right? So there was no actual uh, healthcare professional uh, interaction before receiving that prescription. And, and as a result, uh, Ryan uh, overdosed and, and died. And so what that act in his memory requires uh, is that a practitioner who is issuing a prescription for a controlled substance, prior to issuing that prescription, uh, there must be an in-person medical evaluation. There's some exceptions to that uh, as well, but primarily it requires a medical, uh, in-person medical uh, evalu evaluation before a medical professional can, can issue a prescription to a controlled substance. What, what ended up happening as a result of the, the, uh, the, the health emergency is that that restriction was also lifted uh, in part. And as a result, those controlled substances could also be prescribed without, in certain, in some circumstances, without that in-person medical evaluation taking place. Yeah. So expanding on that, you know, how did the PHE really change the provisions? Of the Ryan Hayden. Yeah. So again, it lifted primarily for Schedule Two through Schedule Five uh, controlled substances. Um, the patient could then have a prescription. There is still some some particular requirements. There had to be a legitimate medical purpose um, for that prescription. Um, and again, the the medical professional is still required the same way that they're required to in an office setting. They're required to act in their usual professional practice. Um, you know, we're both married to medical professionals, and so we we understand how rigorous those obligations uh, can be. There was also uh, some aspect related to the technology that they were allowed to use, um, the communication between the patient uh, and the healthcare professional uh, had to be over uh, an audiovisual, real time, two way um, communication system. Uh, and then, and then, lastly, I mean, look, there's a number of additional state and federal laws that are in play, and the practitioner had to be acting in accordance with those those regulations as well. Um, yeah, yeah. And I would tell you, you know, during the public health emergency, I understand the need to lift certain restrictions that you know existed. As a compliance officer myself, I would tell you. I would never allow my health services by which they never established a face-to-face -face encounter with the patient and then fill a prescription for a schedule two through schedule five um, substance. It, it just, it wouldn't happen. I think it's, it's, it's a liability. I think it breeds bad actors and it leads to a whole lot of problems that people other than folks like your, you know, like yourself, myself and others who, live and breathe in this world yeah they don't think about it and so you brought up a great point just a moment ago and you talked about the expansion of telehealth services telemedicine services and the increase and and 
and the increase in fraudulent activity. Um, can we talk? Can we talk a little bit? Okay, I think we had a little audio, a little, a, a little telehealth. Uh, exactly. <laughs> hey, this is what happens when you have a live stream. But you know, the good news is you figured it out, and, you're and you're back here. with me. So, yes. Yeah. So, um, I knew I didn't say anything to upset you to make you hang Not up. At at all. So I know we're good there. <laughs> so, so we we were talking about a great point that you raised a moment ago about the increase in fraud activity. Um, with the expansion of the telemedicine services. You know, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, yeah. what have you seen? Yeah, so I, I would say just in general, the increase of the use and the availability of telehealth, uh, again, it leads to one, greater investments. We've seen more businesses, the increase of, of, of players in that space. And so it is a greater, uh, more availability of that resource. Two, given those, those restrictions being lifted, the reach of those providers in terms of their patient's base, their patient base is now much, much larger, right? Before it was pretty much limited to you know, rural communities, um, areas where there was a limit to the number of professional, uh, healthcare professionals in that area. And again, the restriction required the patient to be able to come into a, a facility and not just their home. So the geographic reach was much more limited. Now it is, frankly, national, uh, if not international in scope in some of these schemes that we see. Right. Uh, and so as a result, what we've seen is, is frankly, just a growing amount of, of fraudulent activity in this space to give you, give you a couple of numbers here since 2019 the criminal division has led what we call enforcement actions that's in coordination with a lot of the u.s attorney's offices uh, in this space specifically dealing with telehealth related offenses we've charged over 200 individuals for causing more than nine billion dollars in false and fraudulent claims uh involving and related to tele telemedicine yes unbelievable but I think people need to, tell, but I, I know a lot of listeners, they, they hear that and they start thinking, oh my gosh, does the government think all telehealth services are fraudulent? I mean, 200 people, $9 billion. Listen, those 200 people are a microscopic component of the healthcare that's it, that's right. center. We're talking, we're talking a significant amount of money, $9 billion, but we're talking about a tiny segment of bad actors. The DOJ doesn't look at all telemedicine as fraudulent. No, not at all. And, and frankly, as I, as I said at the outset, I view telemedicine as having some significant, truly significant benefits to our healthcare system uh, in providing greater access to individuals uh, who are, when we're dealing with an emergency situation, very much limited or, partic or because of their geographic location, um, or other uh, other factors are limited in their ability to get the healthcare services that they need. It has tremendous benefits, but there is a reason why, and we talk about this over and over again, while oftentimes we utilize the data to help drive our investigations, to help identify where we're seeing aberrant behavior, whether it's prescriptions uh, over uh, over prescribing or other misconduct. So. For example, if you are a healthcare provider and you have a set of physicians that cover a host, an entire portfolio of healthcare services, but each and every one of those doctors is always prescribing every patient uh, DME, that's probably a, a, a red flag for us. <laughs> Where you're, where as opposed to if only your or your your ortho folks are, are prescribing DME, or it's more restricted in terms of the patient population that's receiving that, that type of data we're utilizing that in all of our investigations, but frankly in our healthcare investigations, it is front and center, uh, and so it helps drive our limited resources that we have on the investigative and prosecutor prosecutorial side 
to to really spotlight and hone in on the worst the worst of the worst in the space. And, and and I love that you're talking about data because you know I try to explain to people that data is king. Okay, if you don't understand your data, believe me, the government does. They know what your yeah. numbers are. They know where your 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 uh, aberrancies lie they know who are the outliers in your group and to ignore your internal data that can help you do prospective audits or retrospective audits and make voluntary refunds to the government to get these things yes. off of your book to demonstrate that good faith effort you can't ignore right. the data yeah. it's too critical no, that's exactly right that's exactly right. And we, we try to model that. We, we're trying to utilize data in our own internal data that, you know, again, oftentimes and for a long time was siloed from prosecutors or from particular law enforcement agencies. But that's the reason why coordination and decompletion on our, on our side is just as important as when we're talking about how internal audit and legal and <laughs> And their chief in, in, information folks right. all need to be in sync and working shoulder to shoulder with your compliance function to make sure that all of those components have access to the same data and are responding to it in, a, in an appropriate fashion. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I'd love to talk about some of the schemes and, and why they involve such significant losses to Medicare. But I, I, I think. I mean, if you yeah. could give me a quick, you know, a quick answer to that. Yeah, I mean, look, I when I when I referenced that that situation involving every patient receiving DME, that's not I'm not making that up. That's the kind of right. thing that we see. We no, we, I know. You know, you have call centers, call centers that are based sometimes in the United States, sometimes abroad. None of them staffed by healthcare professionals that are literally just blanketing calls across uh, a list of individuals asking them if they're interested in receiving uh, a new brace uh, and then some some healthcare professional maybe a doctor on the back end is signing off on those prescriptions and then people are receiving some piece of junk in the mail um, that you know simply is not necessary and probably doesn't work and then it's getting billed back to our healthcare system that happens over and over again. That's the types of scheme. That's just one type of scheme that we see we see on a regular basis. That type of conduct wouldn't be appropriate if we were seeing it in a, in a healthcare office. And we, we've seen it in the healthcare office space as well. And it's just as inappropriate in yep. the telemedicine space. I can't tell you. So, you know, as an investigator for a composite medical board, I can't tell you how many special investigative units from the commercial side have escalated cases that have been put on my desk where it's these telefraud companies, right? These DME companies overseas, and they're paying $15 or $20 to an unsuspecting doctor here in the U.S. or a nurse practitioner. And they're saying, oh, we just need you to certify this. And they're not realizing that when they give their NPI number, and they reassign their benefits, you're giving them the green light to go ahead and bill under your name. I can't tell you how many of these cases where the provider said to me, no, they just told me I was, I was certifying the medical necessity for a certificate that another doctor prescribed. You're a nurse practitioner. How, who are you to, to, to determine the medical necessity of a physician who already yeah. determined it? No yeah. offense to yeah. nurse practitioners, yeah, use your head. Right. And some sometimes to boot, they may throw in a you know an unnecessary genetic test. Uh, sometimes they might they might bootstrap some yeah. fake COVID treatment. You know, we've seen all of those types of activities, uh, particularly uh, since the pandemic, uh, and it's frankly despicable and oftentimes dangerous. Yeah, let me ask you because because I know how busy you are, and I I don't want to. I, I, you were gracious to give me a whole hour, and I feel like if I get if yeah. I take less than an hour of your time, you'll actually give me more no time question. in the future. I, I want to ask you one last question on telehealth, and then I want to move into yeah. our last topic. Um, if if a telemedicine company discovers misconduct within the ranks of its organization, what do you recommend they do to address it? 
raise your hand. And I, I say that for an individual, I say it for a company, I say it for your in-house counsel and for your out, outside counsel. Voluntary self-disclosure is the most effective means to ensure that you are mitigating the potential exposure for your individuals and for an organization. It is the most effective way for us to mitigate the potential harm co caused by that that wrongdoing and to do so as quickly as possible. And it dovetails directly into what uh, I know we'll be talking a little bit about, but it, it doesn't change simply because it's in a healthcare setting. It's the same message I have for all of our our important corporate citizens. Voluntary self-disclosure is the most effective path uh, towards uh, uh, towards ensuring that we are addressing that risk as quickly as possible, uh, but also uh, reducing the potential exposure for that organization. Yeah, and I know, you know, I know you announced the um, the revisions to the criminal division's corporate enforce yeah. enforcement policy, right? Um, and I tell people all the time, one of my favorite documents that I read, and they look at me <laughs> like I have all yeah. kinds of problems. <laughs> I, I, I tell them, you know, the, the the criminal division evaluation of corporate compliance programs, that 20 page document, believe it or not, it's actually one of my favorite documents to read, because to me, that's a prosecutor's playbook. Yeah. I mean, look, that's I, I think we could find some some better things for you to read, Sean, uh, but uh, <laughs> but it certainly can help put you to sleep at night sometimes. But no, I I, uh, I have definitely read it. Uh, over and over again, both in this role and before. Uh, and I, I agree with you. It is a significant, significant set of documents that we publish in this space with the objective of, of, of really just providing as much transparency to the public, to other prosecutors, and to the defense bar about how we go about evaluating these compliance programs, how we go about um, making our decisions in this corporate enforcement landscape There are very few documents like it out there, and uh, and I'm very proud of the work that we've done from the division, going back to 2016 when it first published the uh, corporate enforcement policy to now, where it is it is now very much an established part of the way that the entire criminal division deals with these cases. Yeah. Again, there there's so many significant benefits to this process. Uh, again. You know, one of them, I believe, and, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that, you know, it, it greatly reduces the risk of prosecution. It greatly reduces the risk of fines, treble damages, things of that nature. And it, it shows good faith effort on the part of the organization. Yeah, I, I, I say it does that. Uh, it highlights what the potential incentives can be if you do the right thing. Uh, but it also highlights the potential consequences if you don't do the, the right thing, right? So what it, what it lifts yeah. up over and yeah. over again is if you voluntarily self-disclose, if you give uh, full and timely cooperation, and just as importantly, you are remediating that conduct. Uh, you're making decisions to, to eliminate or reduce the harm. Uh, that can be ultimately the path towards reduce culpability, re reduce criminal exposure for the organization. Uh, and, and we've seen that that's been a part of that voluntary self-disclosure aspect has been part of the CP for a long time. And, and my most recent announcements have only amplified some of those potential incentives. Sen and I, we reposted a lot of your comments that is, um, over the last several months. Last and final question that I have for you. And now I'm going to let you get on with your day. <laughs> you talked about cooperation, Chris. I mean, you know, I, I, it's it's almost, you know, what? Late in the day. So let me ask you this question. What if, what if full disclosure is not made, right? You know, what if attorneys are claiming privilege or work product doctrine? You know, how does that impact the full cooperation credit? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. It's one of these questions that's been around for a long time. Uh, as we we train our prosecutors, 
we have a full appreciation of the fact that we never request privilege information in the first place. Our policies make that clear. Our justice manual makes that clear. Uh, we seek facts. We seek information, uh, not privileged communications, not work product. Uh, oftentimes, there are companies that make the decision to waive privilege and provide information to us in that in that regard. Uh, but cooperation credit is never conditioned on the waiver of privilege uh, at all. W what ultimately comes about as a result of cooperation, things like timely producing documents, uh, sometimes it is making witnesses available for our interview. Uh, when we are talking about foreign jurisdictions, it's giving us access to information and, and materials that we might otherwise not have access to. That level of cooperation is uh, the type of activity from a potential uh, corporate defendant that can then be credited, not just in deciding the form of the resolution. So are you going to get a declination? Are you going to get a, a deferred prosecution? Or is it going to be a guilty plea? But it also can inform what level of fine that company is looking like, looking at in, in, in the end. And, then, and again, in our, some of our recent announcements, we've actually increased the potential benefit that you can get by providing outstanding cooperation to the government in those investigations. But what I will say, and I, and I, and I made this point uh, very recently, uh, every corporate defendant starts at zero credit, right? There is no default score. You're not, a, you should not walk in expecting that you're going to get a certain amount of discount. You start at zero and the expectation is that that, corporate defendant is then working its way towards that benefit by, by actually engaging in meaningful cooperation with our investigation. And it's like I tell my clients all the time, it comes down to making a bona fide disclosure. That's yes. what it comes down to. Yeah. Transparency, produce the witnesses, produce the information. Don't force them to issue subpoenas if you don't need them to. If you know that the facts are on your side, cooperate. Yeah. yeah, it makes it easier for everybody in the end. It's not about the gamesmanship. I appreciate you delivering that message. And it is one that, uh, again, over and over again, what we see from these types of investigations is that that co that cooperation ultimately feeds into our ultimate goal, which is individual accountability. Right. We want to make sure that the wrongdoers, because as we both as we were talking about before, corporations don't act, people act. Right. We want to make sure that the individuals within that entity are held accountable for their actions. And that level of cooperation from the organization can ultimately pay real dividends in terms of achieving that that uh, that ultimate goal. Such an awesome interview. Um, <laughs> it took us a little this while to get good, this man. thing coordinated, to get it on the books. Yes, I'm indeed. actually giving you back. 12 minutes of Come your on, day. Man. So I, I, I hope <laughs> we got to do this again. Man. We got to do this again. That's all. Listen, it, 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 it is such an honor for me to be able to sit down and have a conversation with you because I, I, I genuinely feel like we, we had a conversation like we were sitting down in a coffee shop and, and, and just chatting about these things. And that's what I think the listeners of my program appreciate about the guests that come on. Yeah. It's a conversation and it's genuine and it's heartfelt and it's sincere. And that's everything that today was. And I yeah. cannot again, express to you how much I appreciate your time. Yeah. Sean, I really appreciate the opportunity, man. And I, I, like I said, I really do mean it when I say, let's do this again, whether it's uh, over video stream like this or, or in person, I think that'd be a great opportunity for us to engage as well uh, with folks. Uh, but if I could take a, a, a point of privilege here, I just want to give a shout out to uh, my folks, my old compliance team, uh, which is now headed by uh, a fantastic uh, leader, Wendy Hickok Robinson, uh, one of the best lawyers that I, I worked with there at Intergy, and she's been doing a fantastic job uh, heading up uh, Intergy's compliance program. And uh, she is supported by some folks who are doing the day-to-day -day work there. Uh, in that compliance department who are fantastic servants and dedicated employees of that company uh, and it's uh, I, I know a lot of what i talk about in this compliance space is based on the work that they did the work that they do every day and i just want to say thank you uh, to wendy and her team 
That's a huge shout out. And the only thing that I want to ask of you, Kenneth, when we were in Baltimore together, Christy Grimm said that after your interview, if it went well, she would come on the program. Oh, did she? <laughs> I, 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 I need you. I need you to help me because she's kind of ignoring me a little That's bit. It. That's a I big catch. That's a big catch. That's a big catch right there. If we can get, if we can get Christy on. <laughs> uh, I might have to. I might have to come on with her to, <laughs> to make sure. <laughs> Let's do that. And you know what? If we can get together at the AHLA and do a panel discussion That'd together, it would yeah. be such a privilege. Excellent. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank each and every single one of you for always tuning in, logging on, and hanging out with me each and every single day of the week for these Compliance Guy episodes whether it's a Monday roundtable for coding and compliance or it's a hashtag Terry Tuesday or a J squared on our data analytics or our daily doses and our special interviews with great, amazing people in the healthcare space like Kenneth Polite, Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division at Maine Justice. Again, I'll be back tomorrow with a final daily dose of the week. So until then, remember, be good to yourself, but more importantly, y'all be good to each other. Take care.